Hello everyone, this is Dr. Cooley. I'm here today to talk to you about a new topic for Heart Month. Um, as you know, February is Heart Month, and this year we have something a little bit different to talk about than our usual, and that is the effects of COVID-19 on our hearts. So we already have some questions that have been submitted, so we're gonna jump right in, but feel free to ask questions in the comments and we'll try to get to them during our talk today. Um, if, we, if we don't have time or if you come in late, feel free to write them down anyway in the comments and we'll try to get back to you. So here we go with our first question. Okay, so does having heart disease put someone at a higher risk for COVID-19 and why? So having heart disease among different other what we call comorbidities, so chronic medical conditions, does put you at a higher risk for having severe COVID-19 and complications including dying of it. Um, as far as contracting it, it's pretty much the same for everybody, but things such as high blood pressure, coronary disease, are specific heart diseases that can cause worse outcomes for that. As far as why, we don't really know yet. There's a lot of speculation. Easiest thing to think of is people who are unhealthy have worse problems when they get sick and they put their body under stress. But there are also people who are relatively healthy, may have some high blood pressure that are doing worse than you would expect for their overall health. Unfortunately, we are going to need a lot more time and research to figure out the why, though. Are there specific heart conditions that would put someone at a greater risk for COVID-19 than others? So the ones that you hear about the most are coronary disease and high blood pressure, which is hypertension. Those have been the most studied and kind of the easiest to pinpoint in, this, in the research we've had so far. We do think other heart conditions such as chronic heart failure, congenital heart disease will also play a role um, in, in being related and how people recover and how severe their COVID-19 disease is. The other thing to consider is people who have coronary disease and other heart problems usually have a whole cluster of diseases that and, and comorbidities that cause problems on their own with COVID-19. So usually it can come along with diabetes, it can come along with obesity, older age. All those things on their own are increased risk for how severe your COVID-19 course will be and your risk of, along with that. So when you start putting them together, usually people don't have just one comorbidity at a time. It is important to know though, when we're thinking of who we're, we think is gonna not do well, um, most times people in the public think that it's gonna be someone with horrible, horrible disease, but the studies are showing that having just one of those things, being somewhat overweight or just having high blood pressure or being 65 years or older is enough to put you in that high risk category. The other thing we found with COVID is that we don't have a good handle on who it's gonna hit hard and who it's not gonna hit at all. There are people who are perfectly healthy that are having heart problems and severe course and, and ending up in the ICU. And there are people who have a lot of medical problems and they get through relatively unscathed. So this is another thing that we really need to have more research to really pinpoint what, who is gonna be higher risk overall. What do we know about the short-term effects of COVID-19 on the heart? Mm -hmm. So the short-term effects have mostly been studied in people who are having complications with their heart related to COVID. Unfortunately, we are finding more and more that COVID is a cardiac disease as well as a lung disease. So you probably, I know you've heard people say over and over, this is not the flu, this is not the flu. Typically the flu is more like a pneumonia. It can hit both lungs and you have problems with your breathing and respiratory failure. Things we're seeing with COVID that are different in addition to the lung problems is that it can directly infect your heart. It can directly infect your liver, your kidneys, it causes this big inflammation in your body and can um, also increase and cause a clotting disease. So the short-term effects we're seeing are things like heart attacks. Sometimes it's because people already have coronary disease and the stress on their body of being sick and having low oxygen, not being able to breathe is enough to trigger a heart attack. But we are also seeing people that don't have coronary disease where their body starts clotting and then that causes a heart attack. The next big thing we're seeing is inflammation of the heart that causes a lot of irritation. So we'll see bad heart rhythms, sometimes the, thing, the type of rhythms we need to shock people out of. We are very commonly seeing very slow heart rates where your, your heart's not pumping fast enough. This is something called myocarditis, when that heart gets really inflamed. 
long term, we'll think of what that can do. But when people are in the hospital, we're finding that their heart can't squeeze hard enough sometimes to pump blood around their body. So they start having very low blood pressure and they go into organ failure from their heart. Uh, Interestingly, and, and not really the best way, some new studies are finding right now that about 25% of people admitted to the hospital are having cardiac complications. So this is something we were watching very closely, um, but that's the biggest things we're seeing on the short-term effects are people in the hospital having these cardiac complications. What do we know about the long-term effects of COVID-19 on the heart? So right now, we haven't had COVID-19 around that long. So we, we have some speculation about what might happen in the long term. We are starting to see some new studies come out of what we call kind of the midterm results. So we know that short term, you're, you're active infection, you're in the hospital. There's some new things that are coming out specifically in JAMA Cardiology, which is one of our big journals we look at, it's a very good journal. And they have found that people who have had COVID, they started doing tests on their heart about two to three months after they had COVID. They were doing cardiac MRIs on their hearts, and that's a good way for looking at how well the heart's squeezing, if there's inflammation, if there's scar tissue, and all those type of things inside the heart. Unfortunately, what they have found is in this, in this study, 78% of people who had COVID are showing signs that they also had myocarditis meaning that inflammation, scar tissue, and things like that building in their heart. 60% of those who were two to three months after their COVID diagnosis actually still had active inflammation. So that's the type of thing that can cause heart failure symptoms, that can cause irritability of the heart, and a lot of issues with that. Now the concern going, especially with this study, is the people they were studying were not those hospitalized patients that had that 25% risk of complications. The majority of people in the study had very mild disease, they were sick at home, did not require oxygen, and some of them were even asymptomatic. So we're very concerned that we are gonna see long-term effects of this myocarditis in the population going months and years forward. The next question usually is, well, what does myocarditis do long-term? So we have other viruses that cause myocarditis, not nearly as common as COVID. Um, and sometimes people get those, those immediate complications I was talking about, where their heart fails, they're in shock, um, sometimes they need special machines to make their heart pump, sometimes they need heart transplants. But most people that have a viral myocarditis end up recovering if you can get them through that active phase of it. So we're hoping a lot of people that all these cases with COVID, the four out of five people in the study um, that, that ended up with myocarditis after their COVID, we're hoping the body is able to clean it up long-term and not have any permanent damage. The problem with inflammatory conditions of the heart is it starts laying down scar tissue. So anytime you have inflammation in the body, it lays down little tiny bits of scar tissue. And once that's there, it's called remodeling of the heart. That's not a good thing because it makes it so the heart can't squeeze as efficiently and it gets tired out. That's when people start getting an enlarged heart that sometimes can't recover from that. So we're concerned long-term, you know, one year, five years, 10 years down the road, we're gonna start seeing an even higher increase in heart failure over time. The, one of the speculations going on right now that it's, it hasn't really um, been shown yet in studies, but we're starting to think, you've heard of that long COVID, where people have prolonged fatigue, they're still short of breath, they can't do their normal activities because they're just exhausted, they are winded, and they pretty much feel terrible. Those are also signs of heart failure. So there are not recommendations right now yet of if you're having those long COVID symptoms to start getting a cardiac workup done, but I would not be surprised if we start seeing a crossover in the long COVID symptoms and actually having some myocarditis and long-term heart failure issues. That's something you would have to talk about with your own doctor to see if a cardiac workup would be warranted in that situation. If someone with heart disease tests positive for COVID-19, what do you recommend for them to do to minimize the effects on their heart? Unfortunately, there's really not much. Once you have it, most of our care is what we call supportive. So we try to support your body. We give you oxygen if you need oxygen. We, if you are having problems with your heart rhythm, we try to give different medications um, if you're very sick from it. But some of the things you would hope would work, 
things like you hear vitamins, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, they're not things that are going to hurt you. Um, so I, I don't say don't do them, but they have not been shown in any of the studies to actually make a difference. The, one of the, the better options we have overall for COVID if you are infected in the early phase, if you're positive and you have a risk factor and it's been less than 10 days since your positive test and your symptoms started, are the monoclonal antibodies. Um, that's pretty much the best option we have to prevent you from moving into that second phase of the disease, which is that heavy inflammatory phase where people really decompensate. So we do have that available here at our North Campus. Um, so if it's something that you're interested in, you would talk with your physician and they would be able to set you up with that to see if you qualify. But unfortunately right now we don't have much besides just prevention. Speaking of prevention, what are the best ways to prevent COVID-19? Yeah, so I'm gonna sound like a broken record on this one, but it's because it's the things that work. So the first one are all of our measures of our social distancing, staying home if you don't need to be out, don't get together in large groups, and not even large groups, even medium-sized groups, and of course, wear your mask. I've um, been around around the, the area recently, and I know it, it feels like this keeps going on, and this the big surge from the holidays are over, and it seems like people are getting more and more relaxed about being tired of these things, but I really encourage you to stick with it, because it's really the best option we have right now. Having a mask on helps. You know, we're not gonna pretend that it's, it makes you absolutely bulletproof, but if everyone does that, it does help. But really hanging with it a little bit longer until the second thing that is gonna really get us out of this, which is the vaccinations. So um, it's extremely important for people to get vaccinated. I get asked every single day by my patients who are going to have heart surgery, who just had heart surgery, who have other lung conditions, should I get the vaccine? Yes, yes, yes. So the studies that have been done took tens of thousands of people together and they had all of these medical conditions. It wasn't just a small group of really healthy people. It took all comers and this is really who we wanna protect the most, which is why these tiers are open to people with comorbidities. And again, you only have to have one to count. So if you're 65 or older, check, that counts. If you are overweight, if you have hypertension, if you have heart disease, those things are gonna qualify you for getting the vaccine and getting signed up. The next thing people usually ask is which one should I get? And that answer is whichever one you can get. So Pfizer or Moderna are the same style of vaccine. They both are very similar in how well they work. They are very similar in their side effect profiles. Um, they're both safe. They both work extremely well. Johnson & Johnson just supplied to the FDA yesterday um, when that one comes out, I would encourage that one as well. Even though you're going to hear all these different statistics in the news, a lot of that's a numbers game that we're, we're talking about of in these papers. The key to know in Johnson & Johnson, even though they didn't have that 95% what they call efficacy, meaning it worked from getting any COVID symptoms, they had um, varying rates depending on which strain they were looking at. But the key you need to know is that not one person who got that vaccine in the trial died of COVID. And that's what we're working for here. Okay, so we need to get our death rate down. We need to get our, ser our serious complications, hospitalizations, all of that down. And so all of these vaccines can do that. So I would strongly, strongly encourage you to, to go for the vaccine. If you have questions, I completely understand. It's new. It seems that everything went really fast. So I would encourage you to ask questions and, and get your information from a good source so you feel comfortable getting the vaccine when it's your turn. Okay. And those are all the questions we have, unless there's anything else that you'd like to add. Yep. So specifically looking at your heart, another thing we've seen, a little bit different than COVID's effect on your heart, it's COVID's effect on our patients who don't have COVID. So we are seeing people stay at home where they're worried if they come to the hospital, they're not gonna have enough staff to take care of them. They're worried they're gonna get COVID if they come here. So we are seeing people right now come in when they're having big heart attacks or things have kind of progressed to a more serious state when we get them. So you're coming in sicker and we're having a lot harder time taking care of your heart even when you don't have COVID. So I would encourage you that if you are having problems, if you're having chest pain, if you're having signs of heart failure, that you still go to your doctor, you still come in so we can take care of your heart. We will take care of your heart 
we will deal with the COVID issues. We have everything separate, but it's very important to the point the American Heart Association has come up with a campaign that says don't die of doubt because people are doubting that they need to go in or doubting that they'll be safe if they do, and this is nationwide. So I really encourage you to listen to your body, listen to your heart. Also, for those of you who have had COVID, and I've said these things about the long-term effects on your heart, it can sound very scary. So that does not mean we need to have everyone rushing out, getting all these tests, doom and gloom, things are gonna happen. What it really means is listen to your body. So if you're having problems that are new, your legs are swelling up, you can't lay down flat without having really bad shortness of breath, you're having new chest pain. Those are all things you need to talk with your physician about to see if it needs to be checked out. So it's along the same lines of don't die of doubt just because you aren't sure if it means something or if it doesn't. We have ways to test it and figure out. In worst case, we say, you know what? You're fine, you're just recovering, and we're glad you're doing great. And if not, if there's something that needs to be done, then we can take care of you. Okay, and that's all we have. Okay. I'm gonna... Thank you everyone for joining. And Thank you. if you still have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments.